healing in the shot is when I need to know that you are there. That's why I'm singing, be with me, Lord, when I'm down. Be with me, Lord, when I'm loaded. Be with me, Lord, when I'm tired. Be with me, be with me, be with me, Lord, when I'm down. Show my neighbor where you treasure so Help me know you promise you'll be with me, Lord. I'm singing, be with me, Lord. When I'm down, be with me, Lord. When I'm rolling, be with me, Lord. When I'm tired, be with me, be with me, be with me, Lord. When I'm down, be with me, Lord. When I'm rolling, be with me, Lord. When I need you, Lord, be my only shelter. Keep out the devil, shout the door, keep the devil night, shout the door, keep out the devil, shout the candle, everything is on I say shout the door, keep out the devil, shout the door, keep the devil night, shout the door, keep out the devil, light the candle, everything is on I say shout the door, keep out the devil, shout the door, keep the devil in the night, shout the door. Keep out the devil, light the candle, everything is all right. Light the candle, everything is all right. Light the candle, everything is all right. Amen. Oh, when my journey ends, oh, when 
Welcome, everybody. How is everybody doing today? All right, great, great. Josh, Josh is doing amazing, awesome. All right, so welcome to the Heartland Church. We're going to have an awesome worship service today, all right? We're going to just sing praises to our God, right? We're going to spend some time in deep reflection and communion. We're going to have an awesome word presented to us, and hopefully we will take something away with us. And then a little more praising, all right? You guys with us? So we wanted to look at a uh, verse in Hebrews 2. If you guys will turn there real quick, and we're going to do a little bit of uh, jumping around in there, but uh, stay with us, okay? This is my husband, Brandon. My name's Danielle. She, we did. <laughs> <laughs> she did remind me I'm terrible at introducing ourselves. So, Okay, so in Hebrews 2, verse 9, But we do see Jesus, who was made lower than the angels for a little while, now crowned with glory and honor, because he suffered death, so that by the grace of God he might taste death for everyone. And bringing many sons and daughters to glory, it was fitting that God, for whom and through whom everything exists, should make the pioneer of their salvation perfect through what he suffered. Both the one who makes people holy and those who are made holy are of the same family. So Jesus is not ashamed to call them brothers and sisters. And then a little further down, I think he picked the most difficult one for me to read. Um, for this reason, he had to be made like them fully human in every way, in order that he might become a merciful and faithful high priest in service to God, and that he might make atonement for the sins of the people. Because he himself suffered when he was tempted, he is able to help those who are being tempted. Amen. So what I get from that, and uh, we'll, we'll summarize this up real quick, the pioneer of a perfect salvation. How awesome is that? So you guys are here today, along with us, we're welcoming everybody into service for a perfect pioneer, or salvation, perfect pioneer, love that combination, right? That he was made human, that he came down here, lowered himself, not so that he could understand us better, but so we could understand him better. Amen. And that's the whole purpose of us getting together, worship, understand our God better, right? Amen. Let's go to God in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for this wonderful day. Thank you for this time together. Thank you for the building. Thank you for the rain, God. It was just awesome to wake up and hear that pitter-patter of the rain coming down and just uh, enjoying nature. Thank you, Lord, for today that we get to open up more of the kids' classes and that hopefully all of that will go fantastic. We pray for the service, for the worship, for communion with you, Lord, that we will take something away from your awesome word that's going to be preached to us today. And we pray these things in your son's name. Amen. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Woo, woo, woo. Announcement time. Let's hear it for the announcements. Woo, woo, woo. 
Okay, I have some exciting stuff. If you take a look at your announcement sheet, uh, just a reminder, this week we're having our book discussions. So Wednesday night will be the women's book discussion at 7 here at the church building. And then Thursday night, the men have their book discussion at 7 also <laughs> at the church building. Um, and then another thing that's super cool coming up in two weeks, we have our next teen event on August 7th, which is a Saturday. And it'll be the Negret family is hosting it, and it'll be fun. Like, well, they'll be getting real wet is what I've heard. So definitely wear clothes for that. And then I have a super exciting announcement. We have a new dating couple in the church. Ted and Emily, stand up. Stand up, Ted and Emily. <laughs> Amen. Okay, I think Josh has one more announcement for us, and then we have a video. Amen. Uh, first part of my announcement is obviously we all know Emily's out of Ted's league, okay? He knows it. You don't have to tell him. He already knows. Uh, but for real, I wanted to, to share about something really cool coming up. So, our sister church in Springfield, which is just a, around two hours away from us, so they're like our next door neighbors, you know. Uh, they are a little smaller uh, within our, our region, our Heartland region. And so uh, next week, so not this coming week that's about to happen, but the week after that, uh, a bunch of the staff from all over the Heartland, uh, us included, so Katie and I and our interns, are going to be traveling to Springfield for part of the week uh, to help support, to help love, to help uh, build up, to just share our faith, to get some Bible studies, to get some stuff going in Springfield and, and prayerfully uh, to really just bolster and encourage our church there. So not only did I want to tell you guys that that's happening, because that's super cool, super exciting, but also it's an open invitation. If you have free time, and not this week, but next week, to drive the two hours. Uh, you could even, we're so close, you could go for just a day and come back, or you could arrange uh, for some housing. They're not going to be able to provide housing because they have people coming from all over. Uh, but if you wanted to, like, uh, get a hotel or an Airbnb briefly or something like that, anything we can do to build them up and encourage them is going to be awesome. Amen? So really pray about it, really think about it this week. If you're able to make some time to go and encourage them, it would just move mountains uh, for, for them and for our region as a whole. So at this time, uh, we're going to turn the lights off and watch a quick video, and then we'll keep singing. Amen? We are part of the International Churches of Christ. We currently have 711 churches worldwide, and this year alone, Lord willing, we will be planting 44 new churches. Today, let's look at the United States. In the ACR region, two faithful retired couples decided to enter the full-time ministry to lead churches in Toledo, Ohio, and Charlottesville, Virginia. And the region is looking to plant a new church in Washington, D.C. The Texas family of churches had 170 teens at a recent teen camp this year, and over 100 were non-disciple teens, and 25 are studying the Bible. San Antonio sent Jeff and Amanda Henderson to Sao Paulo, Brazil, and Dallas has sent new leadership couples to New Orleans and Baton Rouge. In New England last year, they met their 10-year plan to replant and strengthen four churches in the area. Finally, the Pacific Southwest have two church plantings planned for the year. One in Flagstaff, Arizona, whose mission team is already up and running, and one at the University of Hilo. In Los Angeles, 90 students are participating in summer internships. The spirit is moving in our churches in the U.S. For more news, check out our Kidogo YouTube channel. Thanks for joining us. God bless. Thanks for joining us. God bless. Amen. Amen. We're going to continue singing, so let's all be standing. We're going to continue with God of Wonders.
water, earth, and sky. The heavens are your tabernacle. Glory to the Lord on high. God of wonders beyond our galaxy. You are He 
Good morning, everyone. This is a time in service where we look to remember the cross and what Jesus has done for us. And uh, today I'll be in the book of Ephesians. And um, if you ask my family something about me, what I'm kind of known by is a little bit with a little intensity, I'd say, is discipline. Um, pretty much, uh, you know, my grandfather, my grandpa Jones, he was just a super disciplined guy. I mean, at age 75, 80, he was, like, walking vigorously five miles every day, every other day. Then the other days, he'd ride his bike for, like, 30 miles. I mean, he'd just be intense, nutrition, everything. And I think I was, like, the only one in my family that took on a lot of those qualities. I mean, I would, if I needed to work out, I'd work out. Um, I would even punish myself. If I didn't do it that day, I was, like, saying, oh, I didn't work out before or exercise right before bed. I was like, well, I'll do it. Go an hour later and just suffer the next day. And I would keep doing that and he, through the suffering until I changed myself. Um, and, you know, when I was baptized, a lot of people were commenting on the discipline, and they were, like, saying, wow, he's really changing. And I think there was something that a lot of people can easily miss and something that I missed out on in terms of the cross I wanted to share with you today. We're going to go through Ephesians chapter 2, starting in verse 4. It says, but, God being like the, but God, being rich in mercy, because of the great love with, with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ, by, gra by the grace you have been saved, and raised us up with him and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus, so that in the coming ages he might show the immediate, immeasurable riches of his grace and kindness towards us in Christ Jesus. For, grace, for by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not on your own doing, it is a gift of God, not a result of works, so that no one may boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. Paul talks about grace here. It's through the grace that we are created to do the good works. And a couple of years ago, you know, I would meet weekly with one brother, and grace was all he talked about. Every single conversation, he mentioned something about grace. If he did a lesson for people, he put grace in there. And one time, we were meeting together, as we usually did, and he confided in me. He's like saying, you know, there's something kind of concerning I see within our congregation. He said, you know, when we go in and worship together, not many people are even mentioning grace. He goes, I haven't heard a lesson. You haven't heard even mentioned in some of the lessons. I knew why he was talking about it because, you know, that's my character. It's easy for me to forget that. You know, I could keep doing, doing, doing. And if you look here, the Apostle Paul wrote the book of Ephesians. And if you just read through all of them, it was actually tough to find a scripture because he mentioned so much about grace, and that's what the motivation is, and that's the power of the change. If you need to suffer or persevere, you go back to grace. If you, if you need to change something, if you need courage, you go back to the grace. You, everything. He even corrected and rebuked people who were doing works without the understanding of grace. And when I looked at it, I was like, it's probably been months since I talked, even to my brothers and sisters specifically, about the grace of God. And I was like, whoa. I had to start thinking, well, how often have I been really meditating on this? I've really taken it for granted. In other words, I, did not, I haven't been giving God proper appreciation for what he did if we're not doing that. And I'd like you to meditate on that today, you know, because it's easy to do, you know. Think about it. I mean, in your conversations even today, 
Have you heard or any mention of grace like Paul? I mean, it's very, very easy, and it kind of scares me sometimes. And so it's very easy to do, and just to kind of meditate on that, but really not just now, because it's easy for us to meditate now because it's always a set time every week. But really think about I would encourage you, because that's a goal I'm kind of making for myself, is really start thinking about talking about it, especially with my brothers and sisters, because it's going to get me thinking about it. But as we take it now, just really focus on the cross, but let's make that our goal for the rest of the week. And you have a day, with that, let's go to God in prayer. Uh, dear Heavenly Father, we are so grateful for you that uh, you are a God that's so patient with us. Uh, Father, you know, I just want to apologize to you because it is so easy for me to take you for granted. And everything you've done, sometimes I could just assume things are there for me without even thinking and showing the appreciation for it. And I just pray that uh, for all of us today, Father, that as we... Uh, uh, drink from the cup and eat the bread, uh, that, Father, that, you know, not only now, but just in our daily lives, uh, you know, your grace is the thing that's going to change us, Father, and that we keep that focus, and that, Father, that you help us maintain that focus. We love you and praise in Christ's name. Amen. This is a time in service that uh, we're going to have the opportunity to uh, give back to God. And so we will not be passing a plate today. So if you do wish, uh, to, you are able to contribute online if you wish. But if you want to uh, uh, contribute some, there's a challenge that's are available in the back. Just place the, uh, the checks or the, the envelopes in there. So at this point, we will play for the um, offering, and we will continue service. Dear Heavenly Father, we are so grateful to... Father, that you even give us the chance just to give back to you, um, you know, and I just pray that everybody here, Father, as we give with our gifts, it's just a, with a cheerful heart and it's pleasing to you that, and that, Father, uh, that with whatever we give, you just multiply it and use it to glorify your name. We love you and praise in Christ's name. Amen. 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 Let's stand for one more song before the message. We are soldiers of Christ, all right? Let's sing it. My night. 
eyes have seen the glory of the coming of the Lord. He is trampling out the vintage where the grapes of wrath are stored. He has loosed the faithful lightning of his terrible swift sword. His truth is marching on. Glory, glory, hallelujah, hallelujah. Sounded forth the trumpet that shall never sound retreat. He is sifting out the hearts of men before his judgment seat. Oh, be swift, my soul, to answer him. Be jubilant, my feet. Our God is marching on. Glory, glory, hallelujah. Glory, glory, glory hallelujah. That's a march, if I've ever heard one, right? A march. What are we marching for, for the Lord? Amen? Man, it's great to be here this morning, great to be able to share, uh, great to, to just be able to, to share from God's Word, and I'm going to mention grace now, so don't forget, so remember God's grace. Amen? Amen. It was mentioned in the lesson, so <laughs> there it is. Uh, so it, for those of you that don't know, uh, the Olympics just started. This past weekend was, raise your hand if you knew that. Yeah, that's almost everyone, uh, just about. And man, it, it's cool. It's in Tokyo, uh, which, is, which is awesome. It's weird that it's, it, you know, not in one of the multiples of four years. Of course, we couldn't do it last year, and it feels a little weird to be doing it now, you know? Maybe you have feelings about that. Maybe you don't. I'm not here to talk about that. Amen. Uh, but one of the things that they do uh, at the Olympics, which I think is just so cool, is they do something uh, called the Parade of Nations, uh, where each, each nation, uh, the athletes, maybe all of them, maybe not, rally behind their flag, right, as they, they march through this parade. And I imagine they m marching to kind of like the song we just did, right, <laughs> that, that they're marching with purpose, marching with, with love in their hearts for the, the flag, the banner that lies before them, right? And this, this flag, this banner reminds them of what they represent, reminds them of who they are, reminds them about what their purpose really is, that they're fighting, battling there at the Olympics, not just for themselves, but for the glory and honor for what that flag represents, right? And so... Our flag is a pretty awesome flag. I love it. Uh, stars and stripes. Yeah, America. And, uh, you know, I imagine what it, what it must be like to be one of those athletes, to walk in this procession with the, the banner representing your nation ahead of you. It's inspiring. It's invigorating. It, it focus the, focuses them in on what they are there to do. And, you know, banners have been used throughout history to do the same thing. Banners have been used 
man, a long time ago, right? Since Harold was born, probably. That a long, that, that long, uh, that, that people have been inspired by looking at a banner, looking at a flag that represents something about them. And even to this day, we choose our own banners, the things that we identify with. They've been used for millennia for this purpose, and it begs the question, what is your banner? What is your banner? What gets you out of the bed in the morning? What are you fighting for? What are you living for? From what do you derive your identity? All these questions are so crucial for us to answer this morning. Because all of us, whether we like it or not, are banner bearers. And that's the title for the sermon today, Banner Bearer. Because each one of us chooses to bear a banner that represents so much about what we're fighting for, what our purpose is, who we identify as, as people to our very core. What is your banner? To answer this question, hopefully for us, we're going to turn to Exodus chapter 17. This is a cool moment in Israel's history because it's very quickly after they are freed from the Egyptians, right? So they were enslaved. They were being oppressed, and God was able, using Moses, using Aaron, using so many plagues and awesome stuff like that, to usher them out of that slavery and bring them to something better. However, that something better for a while was the desert. And that can be a little irritating. I don't know about you. Hate when I get like sand in my sandals. You know, like, oh, this is just so annoying, right? And so they, they struggle uh, maybe with sand in their sandals, maybe with, I don't know, starvation and thirst and whatnot. Eh, those don't matter. Sand in your sandals, that's where it's really at. So uh, they struggle with all this stuff and God is able to bring them through so much. But here uh, we get to where we're going to start in verse 8 where Amalek decides that they're going to attack Israel. Okay? So this is their first military battle after exiting Egypt. God has led them away from military conflict multiple times, but no longer. Because Amalek, I'm going to say it different the whole sermon, okay? Get used to it. So they come and they decide to attack Israel. And this is a difficult time, and you, you might wonder, well, how's this going to go, right? God's brought them through to here. Let's see how it goes. Amen? Starting in verse 8, it says, The Amalekites came and attacked the Israelites at Rephidim. Moses said to Joshua, Choose some of our men and go out to fight the Amalekites. Tomorrow I will stand on top of the hill with the staff of God in my hands. Now, like I said, this is the very first battle that they're experiencing. You know, they've been wandering the desert for quite some time. They're tired. They're hungry. They're thirsty. Earlier this chapter, they just got some water. So hopefully they're, they're good for that for a little bit. But, man, this is a moment of weakness for Israel. They are unseasoned, unexperienced fighters. And they are being thrust into a situation they feel like they aren't ready for. Let's think about it from MLX side, right? Maybe they heard of all the gold that Israel had walked right on out of Egypt with. Maybe they heard about the quote-unquote fluke of the Egyptians being crushed by some river or something. And, and of course, they can take advantage of this fresh, young Israel who, who is so green, right? They're still wet from walking through uh, the, the Red Sea, and they, they are just fresh and ready, ripe for the picking from their perspective. And so later in Deuteronomy, it mentions that um, the Amalekites actually attacked Israel from the rear ranks. So they tried to sneak in behind them and attack where all of their like sick, elderly uh, people are, all the women, the children, all carrying all the stuff, Right? And all the, the men, the soldiers are up in front. And Amalek's trying to sweep in behind and, and get them where you're weakest, right? And isn't that just 
like Satan. Right? He goes for us at our weakest points. He doesn't attack us where we're strong and where we're firm. He attacks us where we're weak. That's exactly what the Amalekites did to Israel. Right after this incredible victory of passing through the Red Sea, this incredible victory of God providing living water for them when they beg for it and, and they whined about quail and he gave them quail. I don't know. There's a lot of victory that happens here and yet they still get attacked at their weakest. And sometimes that's us. That we experience some incredible victory. Think about right after you got baptized. You were excited. You were pumped. You were living for God And then Satan hits you with something that you didn't realize was a weakness. This is exactly what Satan does to us, family. And if we aren't careful, he's just going to keep doing it and doing it and doing it again. So what do we do? We need to think about our weaknesses. Right? Each and every one of us has weaknesses, places that Satan will attack. That evil will try and latch on to grasp us to catch a foothold in our lives. And we can't let that happen. So we've got to be aware of our weaknesses. Amen? Amen. Not just as individuals, but even as a church. Guys, we got to look out for one another. If there's somebody who's been going through a hard time, somebody who's struggling a little bit, somebody who is, is doubting, somebody who's struggling in their faith, We have to be there for those people. We can't let Satan just pick us apart at our weaknesses. We have to bolster those weaknesses. Amen? And that's exactly what they decide to do. They say, let's fight Satan. Let's fight the Amalekites. Let's fight evil. Right? This is a a just rude plan that the Amalekites have coming in. And they're like, this is despicable. We got to do something about it. So Moses sends Joshua. Right? This is the very first time in the scriptures that Joshua is even mentioned. But we know from the rest of Exodus and the, the Pentateuch uh, that, that Joshua will eventually succeed Moses and will lead the Israelites into the promised land. And something that's worth noting is that Joshua, uh, when you translate it into Greek, is Jesus. It's the same name. And so This being the same name that Jesus had, and this is the only part in the Bible we see somebody named that, maybe we should pay attention, right? Maybe we should notice that there's something special about to go on here, right? And so Moses says, choose some of your men. Go out to fight the Amalekites. Tomorrow I will stand on top of the hill with the staff of God in my hands. The first time I read this, I was like, what? Right? Like, oh, go fight them. It's going to be awesome. I'm going to go stand on the hill over there. It'll be fine. Right? Come on, Moses. Aren't you going to help? Right? Like, do something. Right? Come, come with me to the battle. If I'm Joshua, and that's my name, so, you know, it's easy for me to connect to Joshua. Be like, Moses, are you kidding me? You're just going to walk all the way over there and, and, and what? Right? For not even help with the battle. That's what you would imagine, Right? But really what he's sharing here is he's waving the current Israelite banner, the staff of God, right? The, this staff Moses used to turn into a serpent in front of the Pharaoh in Egypt, right? That, that serpent went and ate the other serpents that the other guys made. I don't remember exactly, but man, that's where it's, this all started, right? God said, man, take your staff, and this is now something special. Turned into the serpent. This is the staff Moses used to part the Red Sea. The staff Moses used to free Israel. This is a banner if I've ever seen one. That people can rally behind the staff of God. In fact, earlier this chapter, it was the staff that Moses strikes the rock with that then produces living water for a thirsty Israel. This staff is special. And so Moses isn't just like, oh, you know, I'm going to go stand on the side. Good luck. He's saying, look, I'm going to use this staff to do something amazing. I've got the staff of God. The banner for Israel is in my hands, and I'm going to go wave it proudly. Right? This is an inspiring moment 
for Joshua and for Israel. It's really easy to read it not like that. But I think Moses had every intention of having the most crucial role in this battle to inspire the people. And that's exactly what he was attempting to do, to inspire them, to keep fighting, to choose to stand firm. That is what this banner was for and what he intended to use it for. So let's keep reading here. So Joshua, now keep in mind he's inspired by this banner. He fights the Amalekites as Moses had ordered. And Moses, Aaron, and Hur went to the top of the hill. As long as Moses held up his hands, the Israelites were winning. But whenever he lowered his hands, the Amalekites were winning. When Moses' hands grew tired, they took a stone and put it under him and he sat on it. Aaron and Hur held his hands up, one on one side, one on the other, so that his hands remained steady till sunset. So Joshua overcame the Amalekite army with the sword. Wow, what a battle. And over so fast, right? So quickly, this all goes by and just whooshes right past us, right? So let's break it down briefly here. Joshua is inspired, so he obeys and he fights. Guys, it is so much easier to obey when you're inspired. So much easier to put your life on the line when you've got a fire in your heart. So let's go out of our way to inspire one another. Right? Encourage each other. Instill with courage. Guys, let's build each other up. Let's inspire one another to get out there and keep fighting. Amen? Amen. Moses does an incredible job at this, and Joshua takes it and runs with it. And we've got to do the very same thing. Now this phrase, I think it's interesting. It talks about him holding his hands up. First of all, The staff of God is never mentioned. It's just his hands. I think that's interesting. Was he holding it? Was he not? I don't know. I wasn't there. But it doesn't mention it a single time. He lifts his hands. And this stance of Moses lifting his hands, it wasn't some arbitrary hoop to jump through. That that God is like, oh, just raise your hands, right? I imagine them like standing there, like he raises his hands and then he lowers them. And it's like, well, how's the battle going now? Oh, well, the Amalekites are winning all of a sudden. Keep your hands up, right? It's not so much that as it is that this is the Israelite posture for prayer. Hands up, right? We fold our hands. uh, We pray with our eyes closed, right? Almost as if we're kneeling before God, which is awesome. That's great. Uh, But back in this time, Israelite posture for prayer was pointed upwards. So they would lift their hands to God in prayer. They would perhaps close their eyes, perhaps look up into the heavens and seek to connect with God. Guys, this is not a story about the strength of the sword, nor the inspiring spirit of a man. No, it is the power of prayer that wins this battle. The power of prayer that carries them through, that inspires all of the Israelites to continue to fight. It is, this is a story about how powerful prayer truly is. That during this battle, every single moment of it was dictated by prayer. That whether Moses had his hands up lifting his heart to God in prayer, or he didn't. That was how the battle was going. The fate of this battle was determined by prayer. Now Joshua and the army still fought. We still got to get out there and fight, amen? But in our lives, so many battles are won or lost by prayer. Won or lost by our diligence to pray, by our heart, our faithfulness to choose to cast it all to God or to handle it ourselves. Guys, prayer will dictate the course of your life. The course of every life in here. The course of the lives of the people you want to love and reach out to, share your faith with and pour into and encourage. The course of their life is determined by your 
prayer. When we pray, we cast it upon God to win the battle because whose battle is it really? It's God's. It's the Lord's. It's not mine. No matter how much I love that person that I'm praying for, the battle isn't mine. No matter how determined I am to cut this sin out of my life, the battle still isn't mine. It's the Lord's. And we have to pray like that's true, guys. If we really believe it, it should really come through that that is how we live, that we pray, we cast those things upon God. This is proof that, the, that God chooses to win or lose battles based on us, based on us choosing to cast our hopes, cast our dreams, cast our visions, cast our anxieties on to God. Being capable of dealing with all that stuff isn't about how equipped we are for the battle. It's about how much of the battle we spend praying. So what does your proportion look like for your battles? What does your proportion look like for how focused you are on God or how focused you are on the problems? Because the fact of the matter is the more Moses focused on the battle, the worse it went. But the more God, that he focused on God, the more he lifted his hands, he looked up to the heavens, the more that happened, the better the battle went. And the same is true for us in our lives. With all those things we are battling or all the battles that we have access to pray for, the battles we know anything about, the more we get involved with our own hands, the worse the battle goes. But the more we get God involved and put it in his hands, the better it'll go. Has that ever happened to you where you heard about some troubles, about some difficulty, and you went out of your way to say, I'm going to handle this, right? We, we go out of our way. I can take care of this. I'll fix this. And then it just gets worse. Guys, we got to pray. Those battles are won by prayer. I think about the story where none of the, the apostles are able to cast out this demon, and Jesus can. He says, bring the boy to me. He casts out this demon, and they say, Jesus, why couldn't we do that? He said, some of these can only come out by prayer. Prayer is so powerful, and we can't afford to not be deep in prayer, passionate in what we pray for and how we pray for it. Our lives are determined by that prayer. And you might look and say, well, this must have been easy for Moses, right? He'd experienced God. He, he was built for this moment. But the very first time we see Moses make a decision, what was that decision? It wasn't to take a step back and let God take care of it. No. The very first time we see him do anything, he sees an Egyptian abusing an Israelite, and he goes and murders the Egyptian. He says, I'm going to take this situation into my hands. This battle's mine. And he oversteps. He goes and he kills this man. He looks this way and that and buries him in the sand. That doesn't exactly seem like a, you know, a conscience that's clear to me. Moses was built to take things into his own hands, but he was fashioned by God into somebody who had put it in his hands. So there is hope for each and every one of us that tends to want to take control, tends to want to say, well, I am going to take control of this. I'm going to take care of this. I can't help it. You can help it. We can go to prayer instead of taking control ourselves. This story is, is a a moment where we see that Moses' heart has changed for the better. He went from taking matters into his own hands to lifting his hands to God. What a, a beautiful full circle moment. So what do you do when you see injustice? Because that's what Moses saw 
when he killed the Egyptian was injustice. What do you do when you see evil? When you see treachery, how do you respond? And you know, fighting in and of itself isn't wrong, right? Joshua and the Israelites, they fought the battle still, right? So there's nothing inherently wrong with fighting for what we believe in, what God believes in, fighting against injustice. There's nothing wrong with that. In, ca- in fact, God wants us to fight, but first and foremost, we need to go to him. We are at our most effective when we move out of the way and let God take action. You are not at your most effective when you're stepping in, when you're getting your hands dirty. You're at your most effective when your hands are heavenward. When you look to him instead of looking to the problems. But we see here in verse 12 that even Moses' hands grew tired. Sometimes we can get tired. Believe it or not, right? Each and every one of us can can grow weary. We can lose heart, lose faith, be disheartened, just be exhausted sometimes. But, amen, Moses had to handle it all by himself. Oh, wait, no. I'm sorry. No, he didn't handle it all by himself, right? He had friends there with him. Aaron and Hur held his hands up, one on one side, one on the other, so he could focus on God. Sometimes we need some help. We need to be there for one another. We need to be there to lift each other up, lift each other's hands so we can stay faithful. Amen? Moses was exhausted, and there's nothing wrong with that. And so we need to choose to be humble. Let people lift us up. And you know, to be frank with you guys, I am not preaching from strength in that. (laughs) I have a tendency... To want to handle things myself. A tendency to not want to let people support me, lift me up, right? I'm like, you know what? I'll keep my hands up till they're tired and then I'll put them down for a sec, but I'll be fine. We can't afford to live like that. How many Israelites would have lost their lives if Moses would have not allowed them to help? We have no idea. We have to choose to let people in. And choose to support one another, love one another, step up. Guys, I think this is such a cool opportunity. You know, with Tim and Crystal on their sabbatical, for for a little bit it can feel like, oh, well, you know, Moses went off to stand on the hill, and now I'm stuck in the battle without Moses, right? It can feel like that. But this is a cool opportunity for us to choose to step up, for us to step up, step in, support one another. And you know, I'm not leading the church or anything, amen, but I need your support. And I think you guys need mine at times. We need one another. And in a way, them being on their sabbatical is us lifting their hands up, is us supporting them, amen? So let's have a culture of stepping up. This is an awesome opportunity to really see God make victories happen. We have to choose to be prayerful continually, right? And we have to choose to step up. So Joshua overcame the Amalekite army with the sword. Amen. Come on, Joshua. Way to go, right? Then the Lord said to Moses, write this on a scroll as something to be remembered and make sure that Joshua hears it because I will completely blot out the name of Amalek from under heaven. Moses built an altar and called it, the Lord is my banner. He said, because hands were lifted up against the throne of the Lord, the Lord will be at war against the Amalekites from generation to generation. Man, this is such a cool ending to this story. This is the first moment ever recorded in the scriptures where God directly tells Moses, hey, write this down. You need to remember this moment. And make sure Joshua hears it, right? Make sure he doesn't think he's the one that won that fight, right? The battle's the Lord's. And this is so important, so special, that it needs to be written down. So what is that message that was so crucial? Well, first we see 
that he wants to completely blot out the name of Amalek from under heaven. Has anybody gone to visit Amalek? No, me neither, right? I don't even know where, where I would go to check around, right? Somewhere not in America, I can guarantee you that. But we have no clue much of anything about Amalek. And certainly they are not around now. And so first and foremost, we see he's true to his word. Amen? He is faithful. And man, in this story, Amalek would prove to be a difficulty, a hurdle for Israel time and time and time again. And yet God is always faithful and ultimately is true to his word. But I think beyond the scope of just this story, because, you know, him blotting out the name of Amalek, that doesn't mean that much to me nowadays. But think about what Amalek really stood for. That they were treacherous. They embodied sin, embodied greed, that they wanted to take what was theirs when they're at their weakest. They embody Satan in many ways. And so what he's saying here is not simply that this one nomadic nation that we don't really know anything about now, that he's going to completely blot them out and, and war with them. I think what he's trying to tell us here is that he will defeat Satan himself. That he will overcome sin. That he will defeat evil. And that that is his purpose. And how true was that? That all that Amalek symbolized in this moment, God said, it's my mission to get rid of that in your lives. That you don't have to deal with that sin with that evil, with the destructiveness, with the greed, with any of that anymore. And he fulfills this promise with Jesus on the cross. And I think that's part of the picture that we want to imagine here, right? That as we look, we see Moses with his hands lifted to God. This image burned in our minds of, of Moses on a hill lifting his hands to God looks a whole lot like Jesus on the cross, doesn't it? Where Jesus says, forgive them, they know not what they do. Where he says, it is finished. And he vanquished sin, death, the grave, you name it. He punched him in the mouth and came out the other side, the victor, Right? Just as Joshua won this battle, Jesus wins the battle for our salvation. Jesus wins the battle for our hearts, right? Against evil, he wins every time. And this image needs to be burned in our hearts of Jesus on the cross, of Moses with his hands raised. It's the same picture because God is willing to fight the fight for us. We just have to lift our hearts and our voices to him. Jesus fights this battle and wins and still fights it today in our own hearts. In the hearts of the people we care about and we love. And we know from this story that God has the power to win this fight and he will. But it's going to depend on your prayer. He chooses to allow it to depend on you. And I love where this scripture ends. Moses builds an altar. And he doesn't call it, I won this fight because my hands were up for so long. Right? It would have been a long name anyway. He calls it, the Lord is my banner. And this is why this story is so crucial. This is the moment Israel was supposed to understand. There's nothing special about the staff. There's nothing special about Moses. There's nothing special about how we prepare for the fights and the, and the physical aspect of all that. What's special is God. That your banner, your identity, what you rally behind, what gives you inspiration has to be the Lord. And so what is your banner? What are you fighting for? Where can you go to find your identity, it's all the Lord. And so 
Today, tomorrow, and forever, let's decide the Lord is my banner. I'm going to be a banner bearer for God. That he is where I find my identity. That he knows and shows me who I really am. That he proves to me his purpose. Shows me what it is to even have purpose. And that without him, apart from him, I have no purpose at all. That God is my banner. It's the Lord that we fight for. It is the Lord who conquers. It's the Lord whose battle it is. It's the Lord who saves. So let's go to him with every battle in our lives. Whether it's sin that so easily entangles you or your brother or your sister, let's go to God in prayer every day because that battle belongs to him. Let's choose to be banner bearers for God. To God be the glory. At this time, we are going to pray. You have to after a sermon like that, right? And we're going to pray, and then we're going to close out with one more song. Amen? So after the prayer, let's stand up, get psyched to worship. Heavenly Father, we're just so grateful that you are our banner, that you want to inspire us, to love us, to pour into us, to win each and every victory, Father, for us. And I know that the victory doesn't always look like how I want it to look. It isn't always what I expect, Father, but ultimately I pray that the glory be brought to you, that we can all build altars in our own lives and say, the Lord is my banner. And that we can be completely all in with our whole hearts devoted to you. I pray all this in your son's name. Amen. 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 Let's stand. One thing that I like about King David, he was like, he wasn't afraid to express himself in front of God. Amen. He danced when he, he needed to. He shouted when he needed to. He cried when he needed to. Mm-hmm. So as we sing this song, let's imitate David. Amen. Amen. All right. When the Spirit of the Lord comes upon my heart, I will dance like David danced. When the Spirit of the Lord comes upon my heart, I will dance like David danced. Come on! Spirit of the Lord comes upon my heart, I will dance like David danced. When the Spirit of the Lord comes upon my heart, I will dance like David danced. I will dance, I will dance, I will dance like David Upon my heart, I will pray like David pray. I will pray, I will pray, I will pray like David pray. I will pray, I will pray, I will pray like David pray. Spirit of the Lord comes upon.
spirit of the Lord comes upon my heart, I will love thy Jesus, Lord. When the spirit of the Lord comes upon my heart, I will love thy Jesus, Lord. I will love, I will love, I will love like Jesus, Lord. I will love, I will love, I will love like Jesus, Lord. I will love, love, I will love, okay, I will love like Jesus, Lord. Have a great fellowship.